So I wanted to tell a story today about a couple of themes that entwine. So I think when we all grow up, we have parents and guardians and we have moments that connect us to those people. And with my dad, there's one moment and we both know it. And I've said to my dad, if I speak at your funeral, we both know what story I'm going to tell. And it's a story rooted in sports. We both love sports. We both love soccer, football, as we call it in England. But on a deeper level, it's a story about hope. And really, at the core of being a sports fan is hope. It's always about hope. And that's what keeps you coming back to watch your team. And that's what drives you on. To start my story, I'm going to go back to 1958 and a runway in Munich, Germany. And the snow has been coming down for two days. The runway is covered in a sheet of ice. And back in those days, perhaps the safety wasn't quite what it is today at RDU or Charlotte or ILM. And on that runway is an aeroplane. And on that plane is, at that time, the most talented, most exciting young soccer team in the world. Manchester United's Busby Babes. The coach was called Matt Busby. The team had that nickname. Some of the players on that aeroplane were thought of as potentially the greatest players that had ever been born. A lot of them were between 17 and 22 years old. And at that point, my dad was a six-year-old boy who just started to watch soccer games and just read about soccer. What happened next is the sad part of my story. That plane never got off the runway. It crashed as it took off. And most of that team died. And it was a story that transcended sports at that time and was on the news channels all over the world. And it is the reason why now Manchester United, if you say that name or talk about that soccer team, you travel the world, you'll see Manchester United jerseys everywhere. We've traveled together as a family. And if you travel to Asia, if you travel around Europe, if you're in the US, you can't go anywhere without seeing that red jersey. And the real start of that was this moment, because in that moment, the world, the sports world, turned and saw a story that was tragic. So much potential, so much hope. And in that moment, one of the few survivors was the coach of that team. And the message coming out of that when he was interviewed, and just a few days after, with still a couple of the players were still on life support in the hospital. Um, the funerals were being planned and taking place. And his message really echoed around the sports world at that point and was something that my dad remembers really vividly from being a little boy. He came on the television, and at that point, there was only a couple of channels, so everybody was watching the television. And he just said, look, it's happened. We will rise again. There has to be hope. And in this soccer team, I want to create a metaphor for the rest of the world that bad things can happen, but how we respond is the message. So there began a story which captured the hearts of the world. And here we are today where Manchester United is the most supported sports team in the world. 600, 700 million fans around the world is the estimate. And that was the seed of that because it captured people's imagination and it captured my dad's imagination. And from that moment, my dad was besotted with everything Manchester United. And so were so many others born into that generation. So fast forward to 1978 and little me came around. I look pretty much as I do now, uh, <laughs> a little fatter maybe. And as soon as I could walk, as soon as I could run around, my dad put a Manchester United jersey on me 
And he started telling me stories about this team and how this tragedy happened and these young players responded, the surviving players, the new players that came in. It was always the spirit of Manchester United to honour those players. And if you go to Old Trafford now, which is the home of Manchester United, an incredible stadium that was bombed during the Second World War and rebuilt, now there is a clock at the very front entrance where the time is always set to the exact time where that plane crashed on the runway. And that is the memorial to that Munich disaster. And even now, every single game, fans turn up, put flowers. There is a constant supply of flowers on that memorial. So I grew up, my dad indoctrinated me, and it became a thread of my life that connected me really closely to my dad. So I know people have these threads with their parents, and that's you know, perhaps perhaps you grew up and you cooked with your, your mother or you played golf with your father or you had whatever it was, there's, there's often a thread that connects you to your parent. And with me and my dad, it was always a love of Manchester United. And when I was 12 years old, we traveled for a weekend to spend with some family and he surprised me and took me to a game. And it was, for all you sports fans out there, it was magical. That first moment when you walk up into the stadium and you see that lush green, of green field and the fans are gathered, just a real magic and a real feeling of this is something that's going to be in my life forever. So the years flow by. And in this time, Manchester United as a team hasn't been successful. They haven't won. They haven't really captured anybody's imagination with trophies or anything like that. And I go through my years, um, go through those awkward teenage years that everybody remembers. I'm sure I was a difficult son to have at times. And left home, got to the age of 20, 21. And suddenly something's happening at Manchester United that echoes what had happened before. A group of young players are coming through. Excitement is rising. There's the potential that this team could maybe once again be as great as that team all the way back in 1958. My dad is calling me. I'm living in London. He calls me every single game that happens. Did you see that? Are they gonna, is it, is it going to happen this year? And a metaphor for success in soccer, which you'll know as um, people of the church here, is the promised land. And in soccer, the promised land in Europe is a metaphor used for winning the European Cup. It is the ultimate thing that can be done, the ultimate story. So we get to 1999 and I've left home. I'm living in London. My mum and dad are empty nesters by this point, but this thread still connecting us, Manchester United. I'm living my life. Manchester United play on a Tuesday night. As soon as the game ends, my phone rings. And that's the rhythm of our relationship. The season goes on and game after game, the hope is growing. That important thread, that hope that just carries through. Can you allow yourself to hope? And in this year, maybe you could. Young players, games won, games won. Hang on a second. Is there a chance here? that Manchester United are going to get back to where they once were before that plane crash. And all those years have passed. And as they go through the bracket stage of this tournament, my dad calls me after the quarterfinal and he says, you know what, Willie? If they get to the final, let's go. And I said, oh, I'm in if you're in. So... They get to the last stage of the bracket, the semi-final, and the tension's really rising now. And these games are played over two legs, just to explain. So the two teams come together in the semi-final. They play at one stadium of the, of the, in this case, they played an Italian team in the semi-final. So they played in Italy and in Manchester. Now they lost the first game. My dad called me and he said, well, you know, looking back, Willie, all the story of this club, 
is about hope. So don't give up. Let's hope. Let's maybe they can turn this round. The second game comes around and sure enough, all kinds of drama, barely watchable game. So much resting on it, so much riding on it. And that's for me. And I'm 21 and my dad at that point has got 47 years of investment in this team and heartache. And they reach the final. And as soon as that game ends and I'm at home in London, my phone rings. I pick up the phone and he just says, okay. And I said, okay, what? He said, I don't care what it costs. I don't care what we have to do. I'm going to get us to the final. And I said, well, if you're sure, I can definitely make plans to go. The final was in Barcelona. What an exciting possibility for the two of us. 21 years old, 47 years old. This has been the thread that's connected us throughout our life. And he said, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be millions and millions of people that want to go. But I'm going to try and make it happen. Coming up next on today's episode of Storytelling. My dad turns to me and he says, Willie, there's still two minutes. Let's not give up now. We've come a long way. Most aging adults want to stay in their homes as long as possible. And as your loved ones get older, you want to support them, even when you can't be there. Star is proud to offer Star Alert. This new system is now mobile and has GPS compatibility, so your loved ones can live their lives and you can have peace of mind, knowing they can get the help they need with just the simple push of a button. The new Star Alert also offers automatic fall detection, so help will be alerted even if they can't press the button. Call and ask about Star Alert today. Eastern North Carolina is a beautiful place where we gladly choose to call home and we strive to provide the best communication services. STAR is committed to improving communications to all our service areas because we want to improve the communities where we not only work, but also live. STAR Communications, we are neighbors serving neighbors. final was in Barcelona. What an exciting possibility for the two of us. 21 years old, 47 years old. This has been the thread that's connected us throughout our life. And he said, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be millions and millions of people that want to go, but I'm going to try and make it happen. So days go by and he's trying in the background. And a week later, he calls me and he says, I think I've done it. I found a travel company, two tickets to Barcelona. We're going to fly in. We've got tickets for the game. We'll fly back that night. And I said, brilliant. This is amazing. Manchester United of England against Bayern Munich of Germany in Barcelona's incredible Camp Nou Stadium. One of the most famous stadiums in the world. 100,000 people. Barcelona, if you've ever been, incredible city to visit. So the days count down, and amazingly, as they count down, Manchester United are also winning everything else. They win the English Championship. Done. A week later, they win the English FA Cup, which I'm, I don't want to get too much into soccer um, semantics here, but they've won the two trophies in England they could win. Nobody has ever won those two and then the European Cup, the treble, they called it. Never been done. So suddenly now, not only are we going to see if Manchester United can enter the promised land, but they're going for the treble. Unprecedented. Historic, never been done. Can't think about anything else. I don't know who was paying me to work at that point, but they got no value for it. <laughs> the days tick down. Finally, the day arrives. And this is where the fun starts. 
We met at the airport at 5 a.m., Stansted Airport, equivalent, I would think, in U.S. terms to, I'm trying to think of an airport that would be like this, maybe Myrtle Beach, okay? There's a lot of people coming in and out quickly. There's nothing fancy going on there. We were flying, let's say, let's take Southwest and take it down a few notches, so we're on Ryanair. Now, if you've ever flown Ryanair, you know what I'm talking about. This is an airline where you get your seat and that's it. You practically have to pay to go to the bathroom. <laughs> we meet in the airport, 5 a.m. I'm excited. There's fans everywhere because everybody's doing the same thing we are. We go through the first section. We sit down in the only available seats in a bar. It's 5 a.m. My dad says to me, this won't happen again. And I said, I know. Let's have a beer. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay. It's 5 a.m., Dad. And he said, I know, I know. But like I say, it won't happen again. And besides, he said, I can't see anywhere to get food. So if we have a Guinness, that will count as breakfast, drinks, and food. So there I am at 21, having gone through all these years of my dad saying to me, don't drink, don't this, don't do that. And suddenly my dad's saying, let's have a beer at 5 a.m. <laughs> and it was a weird moment of transcendence in our relationship, I felt like, because I'd gone from being his son, his little lad. We were just on the same level at that point. We were two men doing what we wanted to do. So we boarded the flight. The whole flight was Manchester United supporters. The whole flight was fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, grandchildren. The whole flight was people doing the same thing on the same journey, chasing the promised land, fulfilling a lifetime of fandom to maybe, just maybe, have that moment. But also knowing that it could well end in heartbreak and a pretty disappointing end. We land at Girona Airport. 20 minutes outside Barcelona, excitement's high, it's 11 a.m., the sun's up, 85 degrees, beautiful Barcelona day, and then something starts to feel off. We come out of the plane, there's no bus. Murmurings start to happen. The game's not till 7 p.m., so we're not worried, but something's off, and we start to hear a little bit of shouting, a little bit of unhappiness amongst people. And finally, we come upon someone who knows what's happened. And the story goes like this. The company that sold my dad the package, the flights and the tickets was a scam. So there we are, Girona Airport, ways outside Barcelona, Two, 3,000 people all feeling the same thought. My dad had spent what he spent, so had all these people. They phoned their friends back home and the place that had sold us the package, windows boarded up, they'd gone. So, disaster. And my dad turned to me and he said, you know, we're here now, so what do we do? Um, Let's make the most of it. And it always stuck with me because I thought how disappointed I would be in that situation with my son. And the police decided that the best thing for us to do was to be bussed into Barcelona because it wasn't safe for us all to be at the airport. They couldn't fly us back home until much later on anyway. So they bussed us in and everybody was crying and upset and there were children younger than me who were just devastated at this. We got there and... We went for a drink and just something struck me in that moment that echoed what my dad had said to me, which was like, you know what? We can accept this or maybe let's have some hope here. And I said to my dad, I said, you know what, dad? I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna go walk around for a bit and just see, just see what happens. And he said, okay, sure, I'll, I'll get something to eat. And so I walked out of that bar in Barcelona and if you've ever been to Barcelona, there's an area called Las Ramblas, which is beautiful. It's like a, a, a street down the middle, full of people doing street activities and bars and restaurants. And 
everyone else had kind of conceded that it wasn't going to be their day and they were just going to have to watch the game in a bar. But I just thought, you know what? I'm going to have a walk. And no sooner had I walked down the street about 500 yards than a little Spanish guy popped out from the side of the street and he said, hey, are you trying to go to the game? And I said, I am, yeah. But, you know, we lost our tickets. And he said, well, I have two tickets. And I, as a student at the Barcelona University, and they've given us these tickets, and I, I have no interest in going. If you pay me for the tickets, you can have them right now. And I thought, okay, this is maybe fate. I don't know what this is. So sure enough, I get the money out. I pay the guy for these tickets. I go back. I say, Dad, we've got tickets. And we have to keep it quiet. We don't want to let anyone else know we've got tickets. And we're also worried that maybe they're not real tickets. So we take these tickets. We make our way to the stadium, and things are crazy. And when I say crazy, I mean take your wildest college football game and times it by 100. They've separated the stadium, so Manchester United fans are on one side of the city, and Bayern Munich fans are on the other side of the city. There are horses and police everywhere, thousands. The, the, the air smells of fried food and horses and sweaty drunk men, and people are singing, and it's rowdy and loud and exciting, but we're stressed because we're not sure if these tickets we've bought are real. What if we get to the gate and they're a scam and the police... Anyway, we managed to get in. We can't believe it. We're sat up in the gods in camp now. Highest possible seats, 100,000 people, 85 degrees. Unbelievable. Here we are. We've made it somehow. I'm conscious of the time, but I'm almost done. The game starts. Here it is. All these years for my dad, 47 years of this one theme in his life, this theme that's connected him to his son, playing out right here. What an opportunity for a moment to share with your son. But you've got no control over what's going on. The game starts. Darn it. Bayern Munich scores a goal 20 minutes in. Hysterical cheering from the other side of the fans. 40,000 Manchester United fans silent. You could hear a pin drop. Absolute silent. Is this it? This is, this, is, this is the end of it. The game keeps going. Can Manchester United score? No. The game rolls on and on and on. I'm sitting with my dad and we're chatting, we're chatting, and then as the game draws on, we just stop talking. Everybody around us is quiet. People start to accept what's going to happen. You start to hear it. It's okay. They still had a great year. We're still going to be proud of this team. It's going to be fine. The clock gets to 90 minutes. Big orange clock shining in the stadium. That's the end of the game by the clock. I turn to my dad and I say, let's just get our bags and go. I don't really want to watch them lift the trophy. I don't want to hear the end of the game. And then that theme comes back again. My dad turns to me and he says, Willie, there's still two minutes. Let's not give up now. We've come a long way. And I remember it so clearly because I put my bag down. I sat back and I said, all right, dad, fair enough. And they scored. The loudest celebration you can ever imagine hearing in your life. People were throwing their bodies around, hysterical. Years of release. For my dad, 40 years he's waited for that moment, and they scored. Bang. Just like that. Unbelievable. Hysterical scenes of celebration. The ball goes back to the center spot. 30 seconds to go. The other team starts. Manchester United scores again. From nowhere, from 1-0 down, they've won the game in the last minute and a half. And as the celebration slowed down, I turned around to my dad, I looked at him, and somehow, somewhere along this journey that we'd had that day in Barcelona, he had procured two very large cigars, which were in the top pocket. 
And I turned to him and I said, where on earth did you get those? And he said, well, when you were in, I was in that bar earlier and we didn't have any tickets, I just had a feeling that everything was going to work out. And I bought these two cigars, one for me, one for you. And I said to myself, when they lift that trophy, we're going to light these. And that's the story of hope. And although it's based in sports and I think it's relatable across all of our lives that you should just always keep hope, no matter how dark things look, you never know when they might turn around. So thank you. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back with more local storytelling. You're out for an evening on the town. Finally a chance to relax and forget that you left your front door completely unlocked. Fortunately, you just installed a security system from Star Communications. With just your cell phone, you can check on your house, lock it down, light it up, and get back to relaxing. You forgot to put Buster in his crate. Unfortunately, we can't help with that. Security and automation from Star Communications. Call today to find out more. If you run a business, you need sales. To get sales, you need customers. To get customers, you need exposure. Let our team of experts craft and produce the perfect video ad to reach your intended audience while making the most of your advertising dollars. Call 1-800-706-6538 or visit starcom.net to contact our Star Communications production team and get your business moving to the next level. So the hardest thing about telling a story is figuring out, or at least for me anyway, is figuring out a way into it. Um, so I guess one of the first, and I'm, I'm sure all of y'all have had some experience like this, where you remember the first person in your family who died. Like that, that first relative that you had where suddenly you became aware of the fact that people die. Um, this story involves that person in my life. Uh, it was when I was eight, almost nine years old. My great-grandfather, Eugene Chance, lived in Dunn. And he was someone that my brother and I, my mother would take us to see him nearly every week. And all of our family there lived on Chicken Farm Road, uh, just near the food line distribution uh, warehouse on the other side of the tracks in Dunn go through the back way there. Um, and for years when I would go there, I, I remember this was when he was later in, you know, later in life, of course. I didn't know when he was young, but there he was. Whenever we'd go in the house, there he would be in the corner, almost invariably sitting there, and very warm, welcoming. But my brother, he was always more adventurous than I was, even though I was the older brother. I was always a little reticent because there was this cloud of, reverence that surrounded him, the way his uh, daughters and sons, he had 10 of them all together, treated him. And, you know, there are two parts of reverence. There is the admiration, and then there's a little bit of fear, right? And for me, I was always more, you know, fearful. Like, oh man, there he is. He's really cool. Uh, he, 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 but I am afraid to go over there to talk you know, to get to talk to him. And eventually he'd always coax me over with a piece of candy or something. I'd go over there and sit him and uh, sit with him and look at his, you know, skin. As some people, you know, as you get older, it starts to go a little thinner. Uh, he had dark copper skin, a good Indian skin. And I could always remember the way that felt. And I remember when he eventually died, how that looked um, when we went to the wake and seeing for the first time, you know, dead body in a casket. He had a great reputation, um, very generous to his family, someone that <laughs> he had this something, a, a couple things that were passed down. There was this kind of, uh, I remember 
and this was confirmed later in stories that I would hear from family, there was this little twinkle in his eye, right, of someone who was a mischief maker, potentially. You know, someone that wouldn't bother you, but if, there was a, if you dealt with him in any way, he's someone you would want on your side, right? Um, to be careful not to mess with him because he might mess with you, because he had to, to survive and to provide for all his family. Uh, another thing I remember about him, it, it, of the images that live with me about him, it was this picture that my mother had of him, and it was in our house for years, and it still is there uh, to this day, unless my brother moved it. But it's my uh, great-grandfather, and it's it's a shot that looks kind of up at him like this as he's looking off that way. And for years, I didn't know the context of that picture at all. And as I grew older, it, I was told eventually, oh yeah, that's your great-grandfather outside the courthouse for a trial. I thought, oh, okay, well, what's that about? Well, this is where that story goes. Um, and I guess the best place to start would be 1959, New Year's Eve, about to turn 1960. That's where the, probably the best place to go into this would go. Um, one thing I didn't say about my great-grandfather is he was a farmer primarily by trade. But as he got on his years, he and his brother, James, started moving houses. They started a house-moving business, which if you configure moving anything, you know, moving a piece of sofa from one end of the room to the other is hard enough, but to move a house, that takes skill, that takes patience, that takes planning, that takes a good degree of determination to figure out, how am I going to get that thing miles down the road somewhere else and keep it in one piece, right? You've got to know the thing you're moving, because if you try to move something that isn't fit to move, it'll fall apart. If you don't know about the utility lines that you might have to deal with or the, the sharp turn in the road or anything like that, you, it'll all fall apart. And I guess that's what this story really is. It's for all the successful times that he moved houses. This is the story about the time he actually broke one. So, New Year's 1959, about to be 1960. It's one of those cold winter's nights, right? Uh, in the 30s, it's one of those still nights, that weird time between Christmas and New Year's where the excitement of Christmas is over, but the new routine of a new year has not yet started. So you're, at least in my experience, being in that place of a limbo where you can be reflective. The nights are long, they're still... And you can think about, well, what have I done the past year? What am I going to do the next year? He sits out, perhaps, on his, uh, in front of his house. Early evening, the children have had dinner. There's stuff going on inside, little commotion. He thinks about things. He's got ten children. Um, some of his children have already, are already adults. My grandmother, Shirley, being one of them. She's already moved off and became an a airline stewardess in Minnesota. But his other children are still younger. They haven't all been through school yet. And the thing about this time and this place is that he was in Dunn. He had 10 children, Indian children, but they all had elementary schooling there. But for high school, there was no high school for them in Harnett County. So they had to be bused all the way over here to Clinton to the East Carolina Indian School. All right, it's on 421, still there. Uh, and it's a wonderful place. But he would have to do that and think about, well, he asked the Harnett County, he and his brother and some other, other families there had asked Harnett County for years, look, I know we've got elementary school for our children, but we need high school. We need high school. Five, six years have gone by. And... Uh, <laughs> So he is thinking about that, reflecting on that, and maybe he's reflecting about other things, maybe a little uh, gassy from something he ate. My <laughs> mom would tell stories about him just breaking wind in bed with his wife when they, she slept over. 
It could have been a hundred things he was thinking as the new year ticks down. And then, out of the blue, on New Year's Eve, you hear this big commotion. But it wasn't an unusual New Year's commotion. It wasn't the celebration and, and fireworks of a new year. It was actually... Boy, windows shake and rattle. The house there, the house across the street, yes, it was an explosion. That's exactly what it was. And what it was was a school bus. A bus that was kept across the street uh, in a neighboring house had blown up randomly on a New Year's Eve. Why? What was that about? Well, what it turned out is that was the very bus that took my great aunts and, and uncles and some of the other families from Dunn all the way down to Clinton and back 70 miles round trip every day for school. Strange. So he, uh, sometime after that got reported, uh, the police came out, they investigated, realized, oh, wow, this was actually, this wasn't random, this was in the middle of the night. Dynamite was used on this thing. This bus is unusable. What about you, you pesky-looking, troublesome, glint in your eye, Eugene Chance? His nickname was Sun, by the way. And what about your brother, Jim? You both look suspicious. What's that about? Did you blow up the bus? Well, no, what are you talking about? We didn't, I don't, why would anyone blow up a bus? Our kids need an education. Why wouldn't we, why would we do that? That's the only way to get them there. Um, they investigated, eventually didn't find anything or didn't charge them ultimately. But that did lead to more insistence because there were enough people there who knew, yeah, that had to be those chance boys. They definitely blew it up. You know, uh, they're uh, troublesome enough to have done that, even though we can't quite square it. And coupled with this, you go in uh, to, they, they go back to the school board. Look, our children, we still need to get a high school for them. Because at this time, remember, this was 1960. Supreme Court, six years earlier, Brown versus Board of Education said, the standard of separate but equal can't stand anymore. Can't have separate schools for everybody because in theory, possibly that could work, but in practice it absolutely doesn't. Because you're getting separate right, but you're not getting the equal part right. So let's end that, integrate the schools. Well, different states had different responses to that. Um, some States were more militant and said, you know, come on, federal government, come on, challenge me, you know, put up your fists, let's fight this thing. North Carolina was a little more subdued about it. They had the North Carolina Pupil Assignment Act, which really was a way for the state to say, uh, local governments, you all, school boards, you all get to decide who goes to what school. But the way that law was structured was to say, uh, Pupils are to be assigned to the school that they've already been going to, that they've historically gone to, unless there could be some change in circumstance or something like that. So following, this law had been in place for several years after uh, Brown as a kind of covert backdoor way to, you know, maintain segregation schools. Well, for years, not only had my family, had my great-grandfather and his uh, relatives asked for high school for their kids to be educated. They'd also gone through the trouble of, you know, filling out the assignment forms to say, look, we are taxpayers in this county, if nothing else. We're at least citizens. You're not going to let us go to the white school. And all of a sudden you're telling us, well, let's just, well, y'all just pretend you're black, Right. Which, you know, sounds ridiculous because the whole idea is that you would be, you know, separate schools is based on the fact we should keep the races apart, but yet all of a sudden when it's convenient, the Indian can become a black man. And that shows up in the, by the way, in the census records. If you look at census records uh, of my family for years, the chances were always labeled Negro, 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 which is fine in a way because it illustrates the erasure uh, that can happen to Indian identity. It becomes one thing in one context and one thing in another, depending on how convenient it is.
Coming up next on today's episode of Storytelling to integrate the schools, we're just asking, we're just trying to get your attention and hold it for long enough that you will give us our own school. To get the most out of your electronic devices, you need a strong internet connection and a protected home Wi-Fi network. You need high-speed internet from Star. Star has the fastest, most affordable high-speed internet service available for all your devices. We have no long-term contracts or high-pressure sales. Our service speaks for itself, and switching is hassle-free. We take care of everything with free installation from a local company. High-speed internet from Star. Internet at the speed of life. Let's get out of here. Protect what matters most in your life. With security from Star Communications. The story. So, <laughs> bus blows up. Um, but it's not over because no one wants to, all of a sudden the Harnett County School Board doesn't want to say, well, okay, you've blown up our property. Uh, yeah, yeah, bring your kids because what does that encourage? Yeah. Uh, not, you don't want to encourage acts of domestic terrorism if that's the way you want to label it. Um, so eventually, kids still not letting school, kids still not letting school. And eventually my great-grandfather, Eugene and Jim, uh, they say, well, let's just do this. We've heard about those sit-ins over in Greensboro, the boys sitting in the restaurant there. Let's do that, but let's send our children into school. So that's what they did. Next, uh, when school started back up, my Aunt Juanita, who's still alive, uh, her cousin Imogene, and a handful of others, they walked in to Dunn High School weren't properly registered, but they walked in, sat in the classroom. And no one knew what to do with them. Um, do we treat you like students? Do we not? Called the police. Uh, they come out there and the police are saying, we don't want to, these are students, these are kids. We don't want to walk them out there in handcuffs. So can we politely ask them to leave, please? Yeah. Uh, they do. Next day. Students come back. Aunt sits back in there. We're going to sit here and just wait. And my aunt, Juanita, is very, uh, like a less, uh, <laughs> she's got the same glint in her eye, but she's very polite about it. Uh, <laughs> she's not looking for trouble, but if you, if you take her to trouble, she'll, she'll handle it just fine. Um, so <laughs> you sit in again. Get escorted out again, and eventually they get my. That's when my great grandfather they go to court. And they 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 were they were taken to court, and the school board was asking them, please tell these men to stop sending their children to school. <laughs> that's essentially what it was. So there was a injunction issued against them, and fines levied against them, saying you are not allowed to send your children to this high school. So they did what anyone at that point would ultimately do, and again, get an attorney, a uh, firm out of Fayetteville, and they start this lawsuit against the Harding County School Board. Now, it seemed fine, that, uh, like it, this would just be something playing under the radar, because the Indian population isn't very large, uh, especially in Harnett County at that time. And they're all mainly around done anyway. Um, so no one, I don't think my grandfather was thinking that this would get too big. This wouldn't blow up in a big way. Surely not. I mean, he thought about it. He and his brother thought about it. They assessed the situation to say, you know, it's just like moving a house. We, we we're going to think ahead and know kind of what we should do. We kind of know what to expect. We'll get these attorneys, and all we're asking for, we're not asking to 
integrate the schools. We're just asking, we're just trying to get your attention and hold it for long enough that you will give us our own school. This isn't about you know, installing Brown versus Board of Education and making it law in the state. This is simply about having a high school for ourselves, right? Didn't seem like they were asking for much. That was the attitude they went into with this. Well, somehow the news picked this up. WRAL picked it up. And soon enough, the New York Post picked it up. And all of a sudden, there were all sorts of letters and uh, coming in from all across the country to the school board, to my family, saying, what, what in the world is going on here? It became a big thing. Now, to think about this, if this had happened today, oh, a man blowing up a school bus, allegedly, <laughs> and staging a sit-in with his children, this would go viral so fast today in today's environment. And somehow, even in the 60s, it still managed to do that which speaks to the imagination that this sparked briefly. Um, it even went so far as to, you know, uh, there's a newspaper article from Eleanor Roosevelt, her weekly column in the paper at the time, where she calls out this, uh, this very situation at the time and done. And this is where we get to the weird part, because a lot of stories, at least how they get told, especially... Uh, around civil rights issues and things like that, is they get very, painted very black and white, right? Um, it's either purely good or purely evil. But when we dig down into it, it's kind of more nuanced than that because folks in Dunn were largely, were mostly supportive. The mayor was on record repeatedly. Uh, the newspaper editor saying, let these kids in school, let these kids in school. Um, we reckon there aren't too many of them. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Please just make the media attention go away. We're tired of it. They're giving, Dun you know, this is giving Dunn a bad name. Well, you've got the Harnett County Board of Education, you know, and if you know the geography of Dunn or of Harnett County, you know that Dunn's tucked away all the way on the east of the county. The rest of the county, they don't care <laughs> because what the way they look at it, it was like. Well, fine, we, if we let, I'm assuming anyway, we let these Indian kids in here, that means, well, well these black kids are going to ask to go into this school over here in Lillington. And then all of a sudden, you know, it gets seen as a back door to fully integrating the school. So they were digging in their heels. They were determined not to change things. And then, but they didn't know my great-grandfather. And they didn't know his determination to see things through. His stubbornness, uppityness. Um, it's something I'm glad to have inherited. Uh, though my wife is giving me a big frown right now, so maybe not. Um, so the Harnett County Board would keep finding excuses not to find a resolution to this situation. This led to this court action. Eventually, um, after, uh, well, let me put it this way. This, uh, there came a point part of the way into the litigation where my grandfather was faced with this, with, with a choice, right? How far are you willing to go to get your ed kids educated? He thought it was all he was trying to do was just get a separate high school for his kids, his relatives, his friends, his people of his tribe. But the question then got changed for him and for everybody. It was either stay segregated or get educated. Do you give up this sort of tribal sovereignty, which is a bigger issue for a different, <laughs> a whole other set of stories? Do you give part of that up in order to become to provide an opportunity to provide a future for your children? Or do you stay, keep things the way they are and just try to play within the system as much as you can? And it be, quickly became apparent through the encouragement of the attorneys saying, look, you can't, it, it's, this isn't going to resolve by getting a separate school. You're going to have to go for full integration here. 
in the school. So that's what the lawsuit was pushing for. And eventually, the school board saw the writing on the wall, and they, through back channels, communicated to the, my family's attorney to say, well, just, y'all, when the next school year starts, you just reapply, and we'll just let them all in. And just we'll make this go away in just a politically convenient way as possible so we're not left with the judgment. Well, for that year, that intervening year while this litigation was going on, again, grandfather's faced with a choice. How far are you willing to go to get your kids educated? Because what he ended up having, well, he didn't have to do it. He chose to do it. He, he and my grandma chose to do this, was, look, I could. What's my, uh, my Aunt Juanita, for example? What is she going to do for her education while this is going on? If I send her down to Clinton, where she should be going, uh, even though I'm not a taxpayer in Sampson County, uh, if I send her down there, then I'm just reinforcing the status quo and giving in. But I'm not going to do that. But I can't not have her just sit around and, you know, do work at home, I, she, her education is important. So what she, he ended up doing, ending up sending Juanita and uh, her cousin to live with a white family in High Point for the following year. Sending off his teenage daughter who should be in high school there at home instead to live with some other family and get educated for the time. So that's how determined, how dug in, how uh, you make a bet and then you realize oh, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to play, I'm going to pull this one more time. And realize to really put proof to it. You really believe in your children's education? Prove it. Send your daughter away. You really believe in your children's education? Give up on the idea of your tribal sovereignty. If you really believe in your... What will you do to purchase a brighter future for your kids? So he did that. Next year comes around, school year comes around, and for high school, uh, this actually never, the trial never, there was never a trial in this case because it got resolved secretly the next school year. Kids went to school, and as they reported at the time, the Indian kids had a tough time because their education wasn't as good previously. They had a tough time in school, uh, at least adapting for a while, but and you could say, well, that's unfortunate. One thing that I uh, think about that I'm jumping to immediately, I, I had notes here and I've just completely uh, stopped regarding them, is the fact that it, the, the thing he was fighting for, he and his brother were fighting for, isn't what ultimately what they ended up being party to because there were so many things that came out of that. So they got uh, their kids into Dunn High School. That same a year, within the year, they had desegregated it and allowed uh, black children to also go there. The following year, the same thing happened here in Sampson County where there was a federal lawsuit um, to which my other great-grandparents, Brewington's uh, Junius and Corbell uh, were on to. I, I know there's some family around there somewhere. And lots of other, Indian, there we go, uh, lots of other Indian families had signed on to that. There was a consent order for Sampson County Schools. And then it wasn't enough because finally they said, well, back in Harnett County, well, we've got high school, our high school kids who are in an in, in integrated high school, we've got their elementary school kids and you're still making them go to a separate one? That doesn't make any sense. And then eventually there was a federal lawsuit and a judgment there to force the integration of the elementary schools in Harnett County. Um, this was a process that, how it played out in my family, in Harnett, Sampson counties, Indian tribes across the state were having these discussions and all didn't go the same way. It was a, it's a very gray dynamic. I know that for my part, um, well, not for my part, but the decisions and the sacrifices that, and the choices that my grandfather made and my, the rest of my family made, you may not think 
it, it, the changes, positive or negative, aren't necessarily seen immediately. Because even though the first round of Indian kids in Dunn High School uh, struggled, his grandkids who went there, including my mother, did well. I mean, my, my, my mother graduated early from Dunn High School um, and wouldn't have um, had he not done, uh, did what he did. One last point um, about the grayness of things, I think. I think it is. <laughs> And, and this is where I was being misleading at the beginning, I suppose, is this house that I was talking about that he was moving, right? This house he thought he was moving was just, I don't know how to describe it, um, his family, his tribe, his, you know, the, to get them educated. But what he didn't realize is that that house was built on ideas of separateness or segregation or a limited view of what your tribe is, right? That, and it wasn't fit to move, that idea. It fell apart because you realize that you can pretend that you're different than somebody else. You can create a false or artificial divide between you. Well, you're Baptist, you're Presbyterian, you're black, you're white. But, and pretend like your fate isn't tied up in that with someone else's. But the only way he could get through that own bias of his was to broaden his idea of what, what uh, living could be like with other people, of what his tribe could be, right? To realize, well, you know what? Everyone deserves the equal education. I'll give up on my idea of having something separate. Of the things I talked about that were uh, gray, different views in the Indian community of how to approach this, different views in the Harnett, count of Harnett County officials of how to approach this, the one thing I find really I, maybe ironic about this is the fact that were it not for that busing program, I probably wouldn't be here right now telling you about the busing program because that's how my grandmother, Shirley, met my grandfather, Clint, Clint of her cat, who was a Brewington living here. Uh, the two most attractive people in the, <laughs> one of the 50s, four class, I think, of Eastern Carolina Indian School. Uh, I wouldn't be here for that. So uh, as much as I celebrate that, um, I also take uh, my existence as gratitude for what can come out of anything uh, that seems unjust. So, um, thank you. Watching today's presentation of Local Storytelling brought to you by Graves Memorial Presbyterian Church. Be sure to tune in next time for another episode of the Community Storytelling Festival.